So the other day I was browsing through the internet, procrastinating as hard as I could, and I came across the coolest concept. It's an ancient Japanese art called Kintsugi, or Kintsurukoi. Wait, no, no, hold on. Kintsuki. Kuroi. Kintsukuroi. Basically, it means golden joinery or golden repair, and it's the ancient Japanese art of repairing broken pottery with lacquer dusted with gold. I thought this was such a cool thing, because basically what the whole art does is it treats breakage and repair as part of the history of an object, rather than something to try to disguise. So taking that a step further on a human level, it's all about embracing your flaws and your imperfections, and realizing that they're exactly what makes you who you are in the present moment. So I thought, based on that, inspired by that, I would do a scar tour. I don't have any tattoos or anything exciting to show you guys, so I thought, hey, I could show you all of my scars and go through quick stories of how I got them. I'm gonna try to do this in chronological order, but I might get a few mixed up. The first scar that I actually do remember is this one right here. I hope I shaved my armpits. <laughs> I got this scar when I was probably still pretty young, four or five. I have four siblings, Chris, Heidi, Craig, Heather, and me. That's in chronological order. Craig, Heather, and I were all playing treehouse out in our backyard in Tucson, Arizona. Well, to be more specific, Catalina, Arizona. What's up, represent? And my mom was really good at trimming trees. She loved trimming trees. And she had figured out how to trim them to the point where we kind of felt like they were tree houses, but to be honest, they were just trimmed Palo Verde trees. Anyway, I get in my tree and I'm trying to get comfortable and I look over at Heather and Craig and they just look so comfortable. I think this was my first experience with the grasses greener syndrome where I'm like, Clearly what they have going on is way better than what I have going on. So I kind of started whining to convince them to switch trees with me. And Heather, being the kind-hearted, beautiful soul that she is, immediately was like, Holly, you can have my tree, that's fine. So we switch over, and once I was in Heather's tree, I still couldn't get comfortable, and I was like, how come they just make it look like so much fun? Apparently, okay, Craig says that I annoyingly started whining again, which I really don't think I was that much of a whiner, but... I'm gonna take his word for it. They decided to ignore me at this point and said, you know what, just let her throw a tantrum. We're not gonna keep catering to her, which is a good lesson to learn. Except for the fact that my screams, cries, and whines started escalating to the point where I was screaming bloody murder and they finally looked over at me and realized that I was hanging on one of the little stumps. You know how when you trim trees, you sort of do it diagonally? Cause I don't, I don't know, that's what people do. I was hanging on that by my armpit. <laughs> just. I do remember in the car ride on the way to the hospital, laying there and looking at my armpit and just seeing like a flap of skin and blood everywhere. And in that moment, I was probably 50% sure I was gonna go to heaven. I mean, not that I, it was between heaven or hell, it was between dying and going to heaven or actually living. So yeah, that was pretty traumatizing. Let's see, what else do we have? This scar right here. That one, okay, let's cut to a couple years later. We had moved to Puebla, Mexico. I was about seven, maybe, and um, we had a really cool gate at the front of our house. And my mom always told us, don't swing on the gate. There was no reason, though, and I was one of those people that, like, you need to give me a reason. And my mom was a big fan of because I said so, because kids don't need to hear all the reasons. They just need to learn to obey. And, you know, there's something to be said for that. But being the inquiring mind, I didn't understand. It didn't seem to make sense. It was just like, well, why doesn't mom want me to have fun? So I'm going to swing on the gate whenever I can. And one day I was swinging on the gate and it slammed shut and my head slammed into the corner. I mean, it was made out of metal. Blood gushing. <laughs> I think at that point I understood that blood didn't equal death, so that was a good lesson as well. I'm trying to think what's the next big scar that I got. Oh, this one and this one. It's it, They come in a pair. I was about eight or nine, still living in Puebla, making a batch of nor soup. It kind of had like an oil base, you know, when they get like that oily film on top. Loved it. It was kind of close to bedtime. I remember I was wearing my Care Bear purple pajamas and my mom was on the phone. We had really crappy old pots and pans. I discovered that as I picked up my boiling pot of soup that I was so excited to consume, the handle proceeded to somehow come unattached and the soup flipped over and went pouring down my poor body. It was terrifying, it was miserable, it was frightening. My mom was on the phone, she goes, ah, and hung up, and guess what little considerate Holly did? Mommy, no, don't hang up on your friend, ow, 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 Oh my goodness. Okay, so they rip my pajamas off, and I look at my arm, and I start blowing on it, because it was just, it was just, it was on fire. And so I go, 
and I watched the skin peel back and reveal bright fluorescent pink skin underneath. And let's not even get into my leg. That thing was burning, it was in pain. My parents grabbed me and stuck me in the car and rushed to the house of a friend of theirs called Dr. Contreras who went to our church. Thank God for Dr. Contreras. So he lived in a really, really nice part of town and I remember uh, my parents pulling me out of the car at like, I mean it was probably 10 at night by this point or maybe 9.30. Who cares? <laughs> I love my dates and times, okay? Just bear with me here. So they pulled me out of the car and I remember thinking, this is so embarrassing. I mean, I'm just wearing underwear and I'm out on the street and what if someone sees me? They get me into his house and he says, look, you need to get some stuff called the pescohuite en polvo. The pescohuite is actually the name of a tree. I believe that that word is a Nahuatl word. Shout out to the Nahuatl language and my dad who speaks it fluently. He sent my dad to the pharmacy to get the pescohuite, which is the bark of this tree and it's a powder form. So they take the bark off this tree and they grind it up and it's literally just a little powder that looks like dirt. They weren't supposed to be closed yet, but the people were inside kind of like closing up shop because they were over it and my dad was banging on the door until they finally opened and he said, please, 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 I just need some tepescohuite en polvo. They gave it to him and he came back with it and I specifically remember just like my dad comes back and we're still like this. I'm still in so much pain. Like you cannot be at ease when you have a, I think it was a second and third degree burn. And I think that the doctor said putting ice wasn't a good idea and he also said that blowing was not a good idea because you're getting bacteria in there. But I was like, I don't care. I'm in pain. So he comes back with the powder and starts sprinkling it on top of the raw flesh and it immediately adheres and sort of forms like this really nice black scab made out of, you know, this powdery dirt-like substance and that lasted about two or three weeks and when it came up, the skin was relatively healed, as you can see. I do remember though, the scab on my leg, I mean, it was like this big. One day I was roughhousing with my brother and we were doing like somersaults and somehow he hit it and I was like, ah! The whole scab fell off and I think that's why I have a little bit more of a mark down here. But anyway, the pescohuite en polvo, if we could seriously bring that to every country and distribute it and let people know about it, I think it would be awesome. <laughs> I haven't heard of it since and I haven't gotten burnt that badly since, thank God. All right, next scar story. I have a lot of scars on my knee as many of us do. The next memorable one <laughs> was when I was about 17 living in Orizaba, Veracruz and my best friend Lisa and I would go skating and I remember I was, I've always just been kind of nuts and I always want to push things to the next level adrenaline wise so I was rollerblading and some friends drove by and they're like hey Holly que pasa? oh you want us to drag you and I'm like heck yes I do I Really great idea, I know. So I was grabbing onto the back of the car, they're pulling me, I mean they started going kind of fast but um, I wanted to take it to the next level as usual and so I started doing like a swan lake, you know, just standing on one leg type of deal with the other leg completely perpendicular and so I hit a pothole and there was only one leg to help me stabilize and BAM! Smacked onto the ground. You should have seen the faces of my friends when they got out of the car. They were just like, oh, did we kill her? Did we kill her? Luckily, no cars went by in that span of 10 seconds. I was down on my face and my jeans ripped open and this was just a bloody mess. And we went to OXO and asked them for agua oxigenada, which is hydrogen peroxide. The guy at OXO was just like, why are you here with your bloody knee in my store? And I was just like, I don't know, I'm a disaster. Good times, good times. Oh my goodness, I missed this one. This one is crazy. And I'm actually so grateful that I have this scar and not my mom or my dad. Oh wow, this story almost deserves its own video, but let me sum it up for you. So I'm 16, we're going back a little bit. I was living in Arizona. My oldest brother had just graduated from college and my parents decided that this used donated Geo Metro would be a perfect graduation gift. We were gonna drive it from Arizona to South Carolina where the graduation ceremony was going to take place about two or three days after our departure date. It generally takes two to three days to drive across the country. Growing up, road trips were always, you know, a labor of love from my father, especially when the kids, you know, when none of us were at driving age, it was just my dad versus the elements. My mom, for some reason, whenever we go on a road trip, she just gets really, really, really tired. So I remember a few frustrating moments doing road trips when I was 14, 15, when I still didn't have my permit or my license. Waking up in the middle of the night on the side of the road, just feeling like we weren't making any progress. Everyone's asleep, a couple people are snoring and we're just like on the side of the road and semis are going by and you can feel the draft of air like whoo. 
Anyway, I didn't want that to happen. I was like, you know what? I'm gonna be dad's right-hand man on this trip and we are gonna make progress the whole time. And if we're gonna sleep, we're gonna sleep somewhere comfortable. And if not, we're just gonna keep going. So that was my objective. So anyway, my dad had driven all the way from Tucson to like Albuquerque or something. And I figured, okay, it's my turn to pick up the wheel and I'm gonna make some serious progress. Okay, okay, I forgot to mention. So I'm driving, my dad's next to me, and my mom is in the back on top of a bunch of suitcases. That's how we would always do it when we travel. We did road trips all the time. Tons of suitcases, and then all the cushiony stuff on top, and we'd make a nice little bed. So my mom's sleeping on the bed, my dad is falling asleep, well, he was pretty much asleep in the passenger seat, and I'm just sitting here like, uh, what can I do to stay awake? Putting on the radio, and my dad's like, Oh, honey, can you turn that off? So everyone wanted me to make it perfectly conducive to sleeping in there. I started drifting off, and you know how there's like those lines on the road that make a noise to wake you up? My mom goes, oh, honey, um, that, see, when you hear that, that means that um, you just need to pull over. Just pull over. They're all just like so tired, but too tired to actually stop me from driving tired. So at one point I got out, I started doing jumping jacks. I was like, okay, we're gonna do this. I don't even like Coke, and I got a Coke from the soda machine, and I'm like, Yes! And I grab some water and splash it on my face and I'm like, I am ready to keep driving and by the time they wake up, they're not even gonna know. We're already gonna be in Louisiana, okay? <laughs> so I get back behind the wheel and within 20 minutes, I was just, I was nodding off again. And it's so miserable when your body is just like, please let me sleep and you're telling it not to. Let's all remember what it's like when you fall asleep and then you wake up and you kind of have like two or three seconds where you gather sort of data and you're like, wait, what's my name? Where am I? What am I doing? And how old am I? And what is life? <laughs> so let's just cut to that moment. I'm opening my eyes. I feel like I'm sort of at an angle. I see straw and weeds and whatnot with bright headlights shining on them. And I realize that I'm behind a wheel and my name is Holly. And I'm like, so I freak out, obviously. And my first instinct was to jerk the wheel like this because I could feel that I had fallen off to the left so I jerked the wheel to the right. Well, guess what happened? The car flips like Shamu and lands on its roof and starts skidding down the freeway. It was one of the loudest things I've ever, ever heard in my life. Imagine metal, like a couple tons of metal, scraping against pavement at 70 miles an hour. So we keep sliding and then we get to the other side of the freeway and somehow, thanks to divine providence, the car rolls back onto its wheels. And I'm like, what, what? Oh, I have all my teeth. Daddy, are you okay? Mommy, can you walk? And my mom is like waking up from this deep sleep in that moment and she's like, what just happened? And I'm like, mommy, mommy, I'm so sorry, I crashed the car. Can you walk, wiggle your toes? I, I'm fine, wiggle your toes, get out of the car, walk. I remember my hair was like puffed up like this, full of weeds. Thank God we had our seat belts on and somehow my mom, I mean, think about it, she was like, on all the suitcases, then she was on the roof with all the suitcases on her <laughs> while the roof was sliding against the pavement. I, I can imagine that got pretty hot. And then she was back down, fun. I was so scared that something had happened to my parents and I, you know, I was gonna regret it forever. And then I look down and I see that my wrist is like sliced so deeply that you can see a ligament or something and it was sprouting off blood like a crimson fountain. And I was like, well, hey, at least I'm the one that's bleeding here and nobody else, because if anyone needs to bleed, it's like me, because I'm ridiculous. So my dad, super heroic, pulls off his white t-shirt and wraps it around my wrist. And then he went out because it's before cell phones and all that. And the only people that had radios were um, semis. So he went to flag down a semi so they could radio in an ambulance. <laughs> How long ago was this? And I did end up getting in an ambulance and I was super animated even more than I am in regular life, if you can imagine. And they were just like, honey, you're going through a little bit of shock. They found my sandal 40 feet back in the grass. Don't ask me how that happened. Oh, cause I like to drive like this. It's just way more comfortable. They took us to the nearest town, which was Odessa, Texas. Not much going on in Odessa. They found us a hotel, let's just call it that. The next morning, we call my brother Chris. Mind you, this car was supposed to be his graduation present. And my parents sort of gave him the rundown first and then I just remember them saying, okay, we're gonna put Holly on the phone. And so I pick up, I pick up the phone and I'm like, hello? And Chris is like, Holly, so wait, let me get this straight. You are going down the freeway at 70 miles an hour, upside down? Yeah, that's awesome! <laughs> 
and I was like, I'm so sorry that I ruined your present. Sobbing and still shaking, and he was just so sweet and encouraging. I mean, what an awesome big brother. He never said anything bad. He was just like, the only thing that matters to me is that you're okay, and I mean, that is so cool. He's like, nobody could pull that off. Who does that? Anyway, my parents made me get back in the saddle immediately. My uncle brought us out another donated car, an 87 Oldsmobile, in which I subsequently had many adventures, but we will get into that on another time. But yes, I'm so glad that from that experience, I'm the only one that ended up with a scar. I keep sinking lower and lower into this bed. <laughs> so my next set of scars, I think is the most embarrassing. I have something in here that's never gonna come out. It's like a piece of pavement and it's in here too. Actually, when I tried to do laser hair removal, the laser burnt this piece of pavement inside my skin and it started bubbling and scabbing. I don't know if laser hair removal is in the cards for me. So I have this and then I have some scars right here, which basically look like liposuction scars, but they aren't. The story on this one is, it was my friend Jenny's birthday. I went with an ex-boyfriend to, well, he wasn't my ex-boyfriend at the time. I went to her party and I was really excited to see her. When I get there, there was this guy that was my kickboxing instructor's brother. <laughs> I walk in and he's like, Holly! And he runs up to me and like attacks me and hugs me and lifts me off the floor and sways back and forth. And I was just like, wow, that is a really warm welcome. I honestly didn't expect it, but I mean, whatever. I didn't think about it twice until I saw, let's call this person Bob. When I saw Bob's face, I was like, oh boy, Bob didn't like that. And let's just sum up the night. I was having an amazing time, Bob wasn't. And I feel like he was sort of judging me and like even people that I would meet that I had seen at my friend's birthday party the year before he was like oh so you already know that guy it was just awful and I was just starting to realize what a jealous individual this person was I was still having fun I still would have stayed a lot longer but he was like are you ready to go and I was like sure so we were in his car and it was a truck just background information and I told him look I'm gonna drive because you've been drinking and you know, I have barely half of a drink, so let me drive, and he was just like, no. While we were walking to the car, he started telling me that only easy girls let guys hug them like that, and started giving me just this huge scolding that, man, it was just so bad. I remember standing there in that moment and being like, is this happening? Am I tolerating this? So I decided to try, you know, for once in my life to bite my tongue and swallow my pride and just be patient so that things wouldn't escalate even further. And I was just quiet. And he was like, I mean, I, how am I gonna put up with this? And he would just go off on a tangent. And I was just like, Bob, you need to calm down. And he, and he would stop for a second and then he'd be like, no, because blah, 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 blah. And I honestly don't even want to go back to all the things he was saying, but they were very insulting, very inappropriate, and they were definitely coming from a place of someone projecting. I, again, was so proud of myself because instead of exploding, which is what I wanted to do, I was just like, and that's how you feel. And I'd appreciate if you would stop talking now. You have communicated exactly how you feel. And he was like, no, actually, no, I'm not gonna stop talking because blah, blah, blah. And I was getting to a point where I was like, Holly, you're gonna explode, you're gonna explode, you're gonna explode. And so after about maybe 10 minutes of this, I mean, nonstop harping, 10 minutes, it's actually really, really miserable. I said, I'd like you to stop, please. I wanna get out. And he was like, you're crazy, I'm not stopping. And I said, okay, then I'm gonna need you to stop talking. He wouldn't, and he kept going off, and he kept on telling me what a horrible person I was, and what an easy girl I was, and how probably I had encouraged him, and I cannot, I can't even go back to those conversations. I literally felt like, I do not care what happens, I just can't be here and listening to this person's voice. So again, I told him, you need to stop the car, I need to get out, I cannot be here. And he started laughing at me, and I knew that the stop sign was coming up, so I got prepared. I gathered my guts and my determination and my will, and believe me, when I set my mind to something, I'm gonna do it. And so when he got to the stop sign, he had determined that he was not gonna stop so that I wouldn't jump out. And I had already decided that I was gonna jump out, so he kinda came to this a very slow California stop, as they say, and I think it was even less than that, and I was done. Opened the door, jumped out. I landed on my lovely high-heeled boots, and I plopped onto the pavement, scratched up my hand, hit my hip bone, and there I was, face down, on the pavement, thinking, wow, really? How old am I again? Did I really put myself in this situation? Wow. 
So yes, of all the scars uh, and all the stories, this is definitely the most embarrassing one. And I think the reason why this whole katsuragi, is that how you say it? Hold on one second. Kintsukori, oh my gosh. I think the reason why this whole Kintsukori thing resonated with me was because many times when I'm looking back at all the things that I put up with and all the things that I put myself through, because again, I decided to be there. I don't understand why. I regret them and I wish I could go back and redo it and erase that stuff. But no, this beautiful Japanese art says that we are more beautiful when we are broken. Highlighting these imperfections is really highlighting how beautiful and complex they are. Oh my goodness, this just reminded me of my favorite quote by Elizabeth Kubler-Ross. I didn't even know I was going to segue into this, by the way. So it says, The most beautiful people we have known are those who have known defeat, known suffering, known struggle, known loss, and have found their way out of the depths. These persons have an appreciation, a sensitivity, and an understanding of life that fills them with compassion, gentleness, and a deep loving concern. Beautiful people do not just happen. That is such a wonderful quote, and it's something that I keep reminding myself of whenever I look back on stupid decisions, mistakes, whatever you want to call them in my life, which I've had many. I think, you know what? That is all you know, snowballed into the person that I am today and I wouldn't have this depth of knowledge had I not gone through all of that. So, Kintsugi was so inspiring for me. I hope you guys start seeing your mistakes and your flaws and your scars and all of those things as simply representations of experiences that have taught you and have helped you grow and mature and learn and that you look back on things and instead of regretting them, reflect on them and think about what you learned and how all of that can help you be a better person. That's what I strive to do every day and I am getting so philosophical for a scar video. I'm done. <laughs> Thank you guys for joining me on this crazy journey. Don't forget to subscribe for tutorials, DIYs, and apparently ramblings. <laughs>